Hello, my name is Wapnik, and today we will be discussing the linguistic phenomenon known as ergativity. In this episode specifically, we will be discussing what ergativity is and how it works, and also we will touch on how it can linguistically evolve, especially in your very own conlang. Well, let's start with the first and most important question. What is ergativity? Well, to understand it and how it works, we must first define some important terminology. Morphosyntactic alignment, or just alignment, is essentially the rules within a given language that distinguish roles and arguments from one another, govern how they interact, and determine how they can behave in a sentence or a clause as a whole. In one language, one argument may behave entirely differently from that same argument in a different language. This may manifest via case marking, syntax, and even verb agreement. Now, let's take a look at these two sentences. Samuel walked and Arnold taught Peter. What do you notice about these sentences? Well, in the first sentence, we can see that there is only one main role or argument, while in the second sentence, there are two main roles or arguments. We will call the sentence with only one main argument an intransitive sentence and the sentence with two main arguments a transitive sentence. The single argument of an intransitive clause is called the subject, often abbreviated as S. Now the subject is the one who is both performing the action and who is experiencing the action. In the sentence Samuel walked, Samuel would be the subject since Samuel is the one who is both doing the walking and experiencing it. In the sentence, Sarah slept, Sarah would be the one who is the subject, since Sarah is the one who is doing and experiencing the sleeping. The argument who is actively performing the action in a transitive clause is called the agent, often abbreviated as A. In the sentence, Arnold taught Peter, Arnold would be the agent, since Arnold is the one who is actively teaching Peter. In the sentence, Alice ate pears, Alice would be the agent, since Alice is the one who is actively eating the pears. The argument who is being affected by the agent in a transitive clause is called the patient, often abbreviated as P. In some ways, you can think of it like the patient is the one who is receiving the action from the agent. In the sentence, Arnold taught Peter, Peter would be the patient, since Peter is the one who is being taught by the agent, Arnold. Peter is being affected by the agent. In the sentence, Alice ate pears, pears would be the patient, because the pears are the ones who are being affected and eaten by Alice, the agent. Well, now that we have our basic terminology defined, Let's swap out the nouns in our sentence for pronouns, since they inflect for case marking in English. Now we have he walked and he taught him. What do we notice? Well, we can see that the subject of our intransitive verb is being treated in the exact same way as the agent of our transitive verb, while our patient is being marked and treated differently. In linguistics, the subject-agent case is called the nominative, while this patient case is called the accusative. This is called nominative-accusative alignment and is found in the vast majority of languages in the world. English, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Japanese, Korean, Tamil, Turkish, Finnish, and German all display this form of alignment. So you may think to yourself, hey, nominative accusative alignment is cool and all, but what's ergativity? Well, in the exact same way that nominative accusative languages will group the subject and the agent together in the nominative case and will mark the patient, ergative absolutive languages, or just ergative languages, will treat the subject and the patient alike in the unmarked absolutive case and will mark the agent in what's called the ergative case. If we could imagine a theoretical ergative English, instead of having a more agent-like subject, like he walked and he taught him, 
we would have a more patient-like subject and may see patterns like him walked, he taught him. Just mainly focus on in ergative languages that the patient and the subject are treated in the exact same way while the agent is marked. And let's look at some real world language examples. Drum roll, please. On team nominative accusative, we have Latvian. And on team ergative absolutive, we have Hunzib. Okay, okay, I'll stop. Anyways, in Latvian, we can see that the subject and the agent are being treated in the exact same way in the nominative case, while the patient is being marked differently in the accusative case, highlighted here in red. Conversely, we see the opposite pattern in Hunzib, where the subject and the patient are being treated and marked in the exact same way in the absolutive case, while the agent is being marked in the ergative case, highlighted here in blue. Well, you may be asking, how can these systems evolve and come about in a conling? Well, ergativity is highly often a product of passivization construction and nominalization constructions. Let's make a sample language with a fairly standard phonology, and let's say that this language will have a basic head final syntax and a default word order of subject object verb. Let's take the sentence, the man sees the dog. What if in the proto language, are the speakers decide to use a passive construction? Maybe in this passive construction, for focus reasons, the patient, which is now the subject, will be moved to the front of the verb, while the agent, which is now an oblique or an ad positional phrase, gets placed after the verb and is marked in an instrumental case, which is essentially the equivalent to the English preposition by. Now we have the sentence, the dog is seen by the man. Perhaps, as time passes, our language's speakers will become more used to this construction and the instrumental case will become a standard agent marker or ergative case. Maybe word order shifts back to the standard SOV word order. Now, our subject and patient are marked and are treated in the exact same way, while our agent is being marked differently in our ergative case. And voila, ergativity. However, things are usually not this simple. Now, many scholars have estimated up to one-fourth of the world's languages display ergative constructions. Now, notice how I said ergative constructions and not ergative languages. Because, believe it or not, no language is 100% ergative absolutive. And that most languages that display ergativity have it split along other certain grammatical and semantic factors. In part two... We will discuss the different types of ergative splits and the different ways in which ergativity can manifest. We will specifically touch on tense aspect based split ergativity, person animacy based split ergativity, and split in transitive systems. If you did enjoy this video and learned something new, please consider liking and subscribing. If you have any feedback you'd like to give me, please consider disliking the video and writing a helpful comment. Well, without a further ado, Thanks for watching and doodaloo!